so we can share this uh, with your peers. Hopefully, uh, we may have a few more people um, popping in and out, but it is 10 o'clock, so we've got a decent turnout. There's like seven of you. So the goal of today, obviously, if any of y'all have anything specific that you want to talk about, just like yesterday, I am happy to do it. Otherwise, I'm going to make this like the most condensed, as in the most amount of material I can possibly do in two hours with a second out. And so I'm actually just going to have your syllabus up and we're just going to start talking about every single section just briefly and if, if i'm going through it and you're like wait can you talk about that a little bit more just just tell me right just stop me and say wait can you talk about that a little bit more otherwise i'm just going to try to get as far through this syllabus as we can in two hours tell you what i think you'll see on the test tell you what you know you need to be aware of make sure that you're comfortable with these terms so on and so forth uh what you got uh diantha i have one question before we start oh, it's from sure. um one of the questions that's in the bank that uh, Stephanie and I went over last night, mm -hmm. it says, which of the following statement is true of North Carolina real estate brokers? Um, we chose a North Carolina real estate broker cannot renew their license until they have completed eight hours of continuing education by June 10th. But yeah, that's false. That you can renew your license every single year without taking any education. Remember, currency, money is what we are dealing with renewal. So currency keeps you current. If you do not pay your currency, you're expired. In theory, you could be current and inactive forever. So if you don't take, you can still renew your license even without taking continuing education. Okay. Okay. Continuing yeah, education, let me remind you, Diane, the continuing education is required after your first license renewal. So you get your license issued and then you wait until June 30th. And then once you renew, you're now in your second renewal year, you yeah. would be required to take eight hours of CE, which is a four hour update and a four hour elective prior to your second renewal or June 10th of your second renewal, right? So it kicks in after your first renewal and it has to be completed by June 10th. Uh, and then it will have to be taken every year past June 10th. But those are separate things. If you fail in your education, you would go inactive. If you do not renew, you would go expired. So you absolutely can renew your license every single year, even if you have not taken CE. Got it, that? thank you. Speculator. Mm -hmm. Say what, Spencer? Who would do that? Uh, like a speculator or someone that just wanted to keep a keep A, um, a lot of people who are not actively using their licenses for whatever reason will not, they'll, they'll elect to pay the renewals because they know that if you, if you don't pay renewals within two years, your license will disappear and you start back in pre-licensing. Um, and then they just won't take education. And then what they'll eventually decide is they'll call the real estate commission and they'll say, well, how do I fix this education? And the real estate commission will typically let you fix the education even, you know, that you haven't taken in a couple of years, so long as you keep paying your renewal. So there's a there's a big group of people that do that. Not that it's the best choice. The best choice is to just do both your CE and your renewal every single year and just stay current and active. But some people like to just stay current and active. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any other specific questions this morning? I, I can go ahead and knock out before I get into the, the whole spiel of the entirety of the class. I do have a couple things, but I want to, I'll let you go through it. And I think we're going to touch it in a way because it's, in, it has to do with contracts. Okay. Well, when we get to that section, um, you just let me know and, uh, and I'll go over anything specific. Okay. Uh, so for those of you just joining us, the plan today, because obviously uh, two hours, you know, considering this is like a 90 hour uh, course is going to go by really fast and so i'm literally just going to start on one end of the syllabus and start working towards the other end of the syllabus telling you what i think you're going to see on the test making sure you know certain terminologies and things of that nature so we hit the most material obviously i'm going to breeze over certain things like this chapter one but then when we get to agency i'll talk a little bit more about it contracts i'll talk a little bit more about it and then you know the the general idea is if we're in a concept and you have a specific question, stop me and I'll talk about it deeper. But the idea here is I want to cover as much material as humanly possible uh, before uh, the time is up. Oops. All right. So that being said, basic real estate concepts, not very testable at all. Remember, there is slight nuances between land. Land is the dirt, everything below, everything above, real estate all the improvements, both man-made and natural on the land, and then real properties, all of that, plus that bundle of legal rights, right? All the appurtenances and legal rights that go with it. 
Everything else is personal property. Remember, that's a big conversation we have in the real estate world. Is it personal property? Is it real property, right? Is it a fixture? Is it not? And so we'll get into that in more in just a minute. Remember the physical characteristics that we've referenced kind of haphazardly throughout of land. Land in of itself, immobile. That is why real estate is so specific to location. There's also the economic uh, side of location, but oh, let me let somebody in. Uh, it is immobile. You cannot move land. You sure you can move a house. Land itself is also presumably indestructible, acts of nature aside, and then uniqueness. That's also called non-homogeneity. Uh, and basically, that just means no two pieces of property are the same. Even if they're the same floor plan on the similar piece of dirt in a similar area, they're still unique. It is impossible to have the exact same house because of it being a different location. Economic characteristics, the acronym for that is SLIP, scarcity, right? So supply and demand basics, right? The less of something there is, the more valuable there is. Location, also called CITUS. CITUS is a uh, flashcard thing that you would need to know for your test, presumably. CITUS means area preference. I want to be in Raleigh because there's more jobs, because there's more things to do, because there's better commuting, because there's better roads. That is CITUS. It is just an area preference, a preference on location, right? You want to be where there's stuff to do, where there's jobs, where there's opportunities. And that makes it more valuable because more people want to be there improvements obviously make things more valuable both improving the land and improving um with structures and then permanence of investment from an economic characteristic real estate in and of itself is a very permanent investment it's stationary it stays it lasts for a long time it typically has a tendency to appreciate the downside of real estate as an investment is it lacks what we call liquidity liquidity means it can't be turned into cash very easily You've got to put it on the market. You got to find a buyer. It's got to go to, through contract to close, and then you got to, you know, all of that. So stocks you can turn into cash pretty fast. Real estate lacks liquidity, so that is one of those things. Uh, general concepts of land use and investment. This overlaps in both the valuation chapter and this beginning chapter. So I'm just going to briefly mention it because we'll see it again. Highest and best use concept. It's using the land for the biggest return. It, not every piece of property is always used for the highest and best use. We can all agree, just like Spencer was saying earlier, that there may be somebody who owns a home that a developer wants. Well, the developer could turn it into something that would make billions of dollars. But if a stubborn homeowner wants to keep it and live in it, all right, that's what it's being used as. Highest and best use is not always what the land is being used as and is not a constant. What the highest and best use is now will not always necessarily be the highest and best use as things change, times change. We already talked about real estate as an investment. Let me just mention this real quick, scope of the real estate business, because we didn't have any specific slides that really beat this into the ground. Um, real estate business is very vast. It is a trillion dollar industry. There are lenders, there are educators, there are brokers, there are you know investors, there are developers. Um, you know, commercial entities, there's a lot of different things. And so just being aware of all the different facets of the real estate business may come up, you know, throughout testing. Uh, property ownership. Remember, we already talked about this terminology, real property, the bundle of legal rights. Remember that acronym D-E-E-P-C, like the letter C, disposition, right of exclusion, right of enjoyment, right of possession and right of control. Remember, some of them aren't what they sound like. Disposition is the right to own it and the right to transfer it. Right of exclusion, right to restrict access. Right of enjoyment, meaning nobody can claim superior title. Remember I told you, enjoyment does not mean you can party on your house. That's not what we're talking about. Enjoyment means nobody can come and claim superior title. And then right of control, the property and the profits. You can do whatever you want with your property within the scope of the law. You be entitled to all the money therein. Make sure there's not a student trying to. Nope, not a student. Uh, and then right of possession is the right to occupy. So remember what we said: when you are a tenant, you have purchased, albeit temporarily, the right of possession and the right of exclusion from the ho homeowner. The person who has the freehold estate has severed those rights and given them to you, and you would now be said to have a non-freehold estate, right? A leanhold estate. So all of those are those bundled legal rights. Appurtenances. Remember. Anything that's an appurtenance runs with the land, runs with the land. And so we've got a lot of different appurtenances. That deep sea is the appurtenances, right? Subsurface rights, air rights, water rights, all appurtenances. Now, don't get that confused because subsurface rights and air rights can be severed. 
and would not necessarily run with the land, but they are presumed to unless we sever them. Then water rights, we talked about yesterday, never uh, can be severed from the land. Water rights have to stay with the property. And then you had the two, right? Littoral and you had riparian. Littoral, think ocean. Riparian, think everything else. So when we're dealing with like littoral, the property ownership would end at the mean high tide mark. They do not own past that. If we're dealing with riparian and non-navigable, remember you do own your pond, you do own your creek, right? You own into the middle of the property line, however it falls. But if we're dealing with navigable bodies of water, like a river, then you only own up to the water's edge. You don't own any water at all. That's the biggest thing. Uh, remember these terminologies of like boundary shifts due to water. Accretion is a credit of soil, right? Deposits of soil causing more land. Reliction is reducing the water, right? Kind of sounds like reducing, reducing the water, which exposes more land. Erosion is the gradual wearing away of soils, think like the Grand Canyon. And then avulsion is uh, act of God, right? Act of nature. Think avalanche, like avulsion, you know, a storm, a hurricane, something pulling away and washing away your, your property line or your boundary. So that's a very sudden uh, catastrophic mean. So those are all flashcard level things. Uh, doctrine of prior appropriation. This is just something that you may see. In other words, if avulsion was to destroy your property boundaries where your ownership ended, you are allowed to restore it back to what it was within a set period of time under most circumstances. That's what that's talking about. So like if a hurricane came in and, you know, you had a beach house and the mean high tide mark was eroded away and that's where your property was, you could restore the beaches and restore your, your beach to the way it was. Uh, support rights. Remember, we briefly talked about these right of lateral support and right of subjacent support. Lateral support is your neighbor cannot do anything to destroy the structural integrity of your property and you can't do anything to theirs, right? Vice versa. And then the other one, right of subjacent support is if you have severed off the mineral oil and gas rights or any subsurface rights, um, they can't do anything to, they can come and mine anytime. You can't restrict that but they can't do anything to destroy your the structural integrity of your property, right? They can't frack underneath your house and cause your house to fall in or your soils to erode, anything like that. Uh, personal property, remember that word chattel, movable personal property. That is a flashcard level terminology, right? You, you will see that. Personality is just another word for personal property as well. So if you see a, a question reference personality, it just means personal property. So anytime we're dealing with personal property, right? Movable items, they're not attached to the house. That when we are talking about these, these, these two terminologies that come into play, severance and annexation. Remember what I told you. If you were to think about a house being built before it's a structure, it's just a pile of resources, timber, bricks, mortar, concrete, center blocks, right? Um, all of that is personal property, but then once it gets attached and becomes a house, it becomes real property. So annexation is taking a piece of personal property, attaching it to a house, and now it's real property. Severance is the opposite, taking something that is considered real property and removing it. And the key piece here is a buyer and a seller would need to be aware of this because if a seller wanted to take something with them that was considered a fixture, they would have to sever it from the property. Now it sounds so formal, but remember, how do we actually sever something from the property. How did we actually do it? Contract that you're going to take it. That's it. That's literally it. Put it in the contract as an exclusion. And then if all parties agree, you get to take it. That's it. Uh, remember these other special terminologies, fruits of the soil. We have fructus naturalis, which are considered real property, right? Your rose bush, your uh, pine tree, your oak tree, they, they're staying. They're real property. They're part of the house. But then we also had fructus industrialis, also called implements, implements, which is uh, corn, uh, potatoes, right? Harvestable crops. Even if the owner of the crops is leasing the land, those crops belong to the farmer. They're personal property, not real property. Uh, fixtures, remember the total circumstance test. I gave you the acronym because the slides didn't have the full acronym, but you do need to know the full acronym. And that was IRMA. Right here. 
Also remember that the total circumstance test is a legal test. This is what the courts are using. Please don't get this confused with how we deal with real property and personal property as real estate brokers. We deal with it by annexation or severance on the sales contract. But if we mess up, the courts would have to go between the buyer and the seller and decide who was right. One person thinks it's a fixture, one thinks it's personal property. And so it is a legal test for the courts. And it is intent of the annex, or remember that word annexation, intent of the person who attached it, relationship of the person who attached it, right? Were they a tenant? Were they an owner? Method of annexation, meaning is how permanent is it? You know, nailed, screwed, or glued yet again. And then adaptation of the real estate. How funny would this property look if we remove this, right? How much have you changed the property to accommodate this? And the other thing that you have to understand is Irma is it. They do not consider value, size, or location. So please be very careful because if they give you some kind of question on this, right? Um, the courts are, you know, trying to apply the total circumstance test. And, um, you know, it's uh, a giant thing worth $10,000 and something, something, something. So it's probably going to be at this. No, they do not care about size, value, or location. So if they give you a question, then ask if they're going to consider that. They're not. They are only going to consider those four things, IRMA, intent, relationship, method, and adaptation. Remember a trade fixture, also called a what? Who remembers a special name for a trade fixture? It's an oxymoron. We just said the word. Shadow? Chattel fixture, chattel fixture. Remember, it's ironic because chattel is personal property. A fixture is real property. So that's why I call this an oxymoron because it's also called a chattel fixture, which means movable fixture. That is when you are leasing a commercial space as a business owner and you put in your ovens, you buy and put in your, your tables, your refrigerators. You can take them with you when you go. They are personal property. Now, don't get confused. If you abandon them, the landlord may gain them by uh, accession, right? But they're not going to be his automatically. So you are allowed to take them with you. That's a special category. The other special category of fixture we talked about was the agricultural fixture in North Carolina. Remember, if somebody's leasing your farmland and they install a grain silo, that grain silo is now real property. Belongs to the uh, landlord farm, uh, owner, okay? This... When you attach something on farmland, it automatically becomes a fixture, right? Part of real property. You cannot take it with you. Now, don't get squirrely on me. I told you anything is negotiable in the real estate world. So could, uh, like, don't worry about the tenant. Could they negotiate with the landlord to be able to take it down? Sure. But don't focus on what you think is fair. Focus on what I'm telling you, right? Uh, the other thing is that I don't think we really touched on this in the slides nearly enough. So let me just talk about this for a second. Oops. Well, this is fine. The UCC, Uniform Commercial Code, is a special code in North Carolina that says if it's something that would normally be considered a fixture, but there is a security agreement on it by a creditor, then it's going to stay personal property. Think about it. Is a dishwasher real property or personal property? Personal. <clears throat> no, it's fixed. It's dishwasher and ovens i told you special north carolina those those are fixtures refrigerators personal refrigerator yeah refrigerators personal so let's talk about this if you were dealing with like your uh dishwasher broke and you went out and didn't have a thousand dollars to buy a new one so you went to aaron's and you got a new dishwasher from aaron's or rena center they're going to hold a security agreement against that so if you install it in your home it's still considered personal property, even though it normally would be considered a fixture because a creditor has a security agreement against it. So this is something that we would need to disclose and have discussions of in the real estate world. Same thing too. If you're heating an air conditioning system, you finance it because you don't have $9,000 to spend on it out of pocket. Well, you would need to pay it off at closing. Otherwise, if somebody buys your house and you don't disclose it and you stop making payments, the company can come remove that AC unit. So that is a very important thing to understand about the UCC, Uniform Commercial Code. Even if it would normally be considered a fixture, if there is a security agreement by a creditor, it remains personal property that can be removed if you stop paying. Everybody good on that? 
Uh, this is a, a very just small little <clears throat> nuance. Improvements to the land versus improvements on the land. Remember, improvements to the land are public in nature and improvements on the land are private in nature, right? Putting a house or a fence is on the land. Um, putting a sidewalk, septic or sewer is improvements to the land, right? And if you want to get technical improvements on the land, we change it from quote unquote land to real estate as well, which kind of changes things up a little bit. Um, <clears throat> this is we can fly through this a little bit more <clears throat> remember manufactured homes are personal property also called mobile homes not to be confused with modular mobile homes are built to hud standards minimum construction standards by the department of housing and urban development the modular homes have to be built to the same state and local building codes you can convert a mobile home to real property if you remove the axles wheels and hitch sell it on a permanent foundation and file an affidavit of conversion with the dmv so you stop paying personal property taxes. That is the only way that you can convert modular homes. I'm sorry, mobile homes, but mobile homes, also called ma uh, manufactured. Modular automatically becomes real property when they're installed on the foundation. They are not the same, okay? Have to be built to local state building codes. Cool. Oh, thanks, Spencer. Yeah, I have a couple of different Zoom accounts. So the one that I normally teach off from, I've never uploaded a picture. So like this one has my default picture. <laughs> um, we just talked about this, but let me just touch on them real quick because I know this is confusing for a lot of people, right? So when we're talking about estates, what does that word estate mean? Interest. Interest. What level of interest does somebody have in a property, right? Are they an owner? Are they a partial owner? Are they a tenant? Are they, you know, whatever? And so this is where we got into this uh, most recently, um, like last week and uh, a couple of days ago. So freehold estates are estates of ownership. You presumably own it for, we don't know how long, right? An indeterminable period of time until you decide to sell, until something else happens, you own it. When we were talking about those freehold estates, there was those two different types that we broke it down to, multiple types actually. But you need to be thinking about estates of inheritance, meaning they can do what with it? Pass it down. Will it? That's exactly right. Versus in states not of inheritance, meaning you cannot will it. And so we have the estates of inheritance. We had your fee simple. Remember on a test, fee simple will translate to fee simple absolute. Although high, highest and best form of ownership, no restrictions, right? No limitations, except the law. That's the best one. And then we had fee, defeasible fee, right? Also called qualified fee. Notice how this is the syllabus. I'm telling you, the fact that they put this in parentheses means you could see either name. They could call it defeasible fee or qualified fee. And remember, of those, there was two types. Fee simple determinable, which is saying you have to do this. We have determined what you can do. Remember the Dorothea Dix thing. Mm -hmm. So long as you use it as this, it's yours. If you stop, it automatically reverts back. Then the other one was that long mouthy name, fee simple subject to a condition subsequent. Do whatever you want so long as you don't do this one thing. Mm -hmm. If you do this one thing, then the grantor has the right to take it back by court proceeding. Okay. So those were those qualified fee or defeasible. And then we had the life estate per ultra V for the life of another. That is also in a state of inheritance. Remember, a life tenant does own it. They live in it, they inhabit it, they can sell it, they can rent it, they can en encumber it, but it doesn't change the way that you own it. So that's why I told you, can you sell it? Sure. But when you tell somebody like, well, I only own it until this person's alive. The life estate per ultra V is also willable because if you die, but the measuring life is still alive, it's still yours to give. So I'd say, Nicole, this is yours so long as Vi is alive. If Nicole kicks the bucket, it's still Nicole's to have, so she could leave it to her kids or anybody she wanted to. And then that new person would own it so long as Vi was alive. So be very careful, right? Life estate parole trivi is an estate of inheritance because you could die before the measuring life. Now, does the measuring life have any ownership interest in any way, shape, or form? No. It doesn't have to. No, it doesn't have. I mean, I suppose they could, right? The, the yeah. you know, but presumably not. Um, they're typically just a unit of measure. That's it. Mm -hmm. 
Then we had the estates not of inheritance, and that was the conventional life estate. Remember, the life tenant is the measuring life. That's why you can't be inherited. The second you no longer are alive, it's not yours anymore, which is why you can't give it to anybody else. So then both of those life estates, both per ultra V and conventional would typically name a reversionary interest or remainder interest. Remember, reversionary interest goes back to the grantor or the grantor's heirs. And a remainder interest would go to a named third party. It says when this person's ownership ends, it would go to this person. Mm -hmm. If you have a reversionary interest, you are said to have an estate in remainder, meaning you don't own it yet, but you will. If you have a remainder man interest, you once again, you don't own it yet, but you will. So it's called an estate in remainder. So be very careful with those terminologies. They may use those. Marital life estates, I told you, you can't disinherit your spouse. And so if you die with a will, and you choose on your will to leave your spouse nothing, this government's going to be like, well, you can't do that. You were married, right? And so they're going to basically give them something. It's what we call a uh, an elective share based on a length of marriage approach. They would say, well, how long were you married and how much do we think that they were entitled to? So this goes back to some of those questions, right? Where if you, if you were to will your entire house to your son, well, your son will not get it outright. Your wife... Uh, your spouse, right, would probably have some interest of it granted by the courts uh, after they go through probate. But there's no standard of, uh, percentage, percentage of interest that's variable? Yeah, because it's, it's like I said, it's the length of marriage approach. If you've been married oh. for 40 years, you're probably going to get a lot more than if you've been married for one year. You see what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. right. Like everything else negotiable. And like everything else negotiable. Yep. Uh, homestead, you may see homestead is just a special classification that some people would put their home in, which basically protects it from creditors. Um, you know, it's not too dissimilar from the same concept of like filing a certain type of bankruptcy where you get to keep your home. A homestead exemption is just, like I said, a legal agreement where creditors will not go after your home because of protections and you need a place to live. That's what that is. Not to be confused with like homestead tax exemptions that some states have. So that's what we're talking about. It's just protecting your home. Um, then we had the non-freeholder leasehold estates. We covered those kind of side by side. The syllabus covers them in a very different place, which is with property management, which is what we wrapped up with yesterday. Ownership. Remember, you can have ownership in severalty. Remember, think severed. Severalty is one owner. Now, please don't get confused because... I want to point out something, and I don't know if it's still on this or not. Okay, so it's not on there anymore. Um, just be just be very careful on um, that terminology, severalty, because I have seen some things say that uh, a tenant in common would own their share in severalty understand that's kind of contradictory because it's concurrent ownership, but then it's talking about ownership and severalty, but don't overthink it because at the end of the day, what it means is you own your share by yourself, right? You own your 25% in severalty, not the property in severalty. Does that make sense? So just be very careful with that terminology. Severalty is, is sole ownership, okay? Just one person or entity. And then we have the concurrent ownerships, right? Which is where multiple people are owning it in tandem. Remember, tenancy in common Never, ever, 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 ever <coughs> has right of survivorship. It can always be willed. It can be sold. It can be willed. It can be for anybody. No problem. It does not have to be equal shares. Tenancy in common. Joint tenancy. Can you say that Go again, ahead. sir? Can you say can that, that again? again? Yes, please. Yeah. Tenancy in common never, ever, ever, ever has right of survivorship. You will always be able to will your share of tenants in common. If you are a 50% owner as tenants in common, your 50% can go to your kids. So if you've got two kids, they could each get 25%, right? If you've got three kids, they'd each get 33.3 or not that. It would be like 13.7 or whatever it is. But you see what I'm saying? It can always be willed. Also, tenancy in common is for anybody. You do not have to have a special relationship and it does not have to be equal shares. Joint tenancy typically designed with a right of survivorship. Now we told you in North Carolina, we use this specific verbiage that says with right of survivorship, but in other states, it defaults to with right of survivorship. So you can never will your joint tenancy. You can sell it. And if you sell it, the new owner is going to come in as a tenant in common of your share. 
because joint tenancy has to have that unity of time, title, possession, and interest. Meaning we all took title at the same time, same level of interest, although it doesn't have to be equal shares, but that's how it works. So if somebody else buys somebody's joint tenancy, they would come in as a tenant in common. Remember, if we have a scenario where everybody has sold their share except for one joint tenant, well, even that joint tenant is now a tenant in common because you can never have joint tenancy with just one person. Have to have at least two for joint tenancy. So it does have right of survivorship and it can't be willed. Correct. Joint right. tenancy has right of survivorship, can't be willed. So if you get a scenario that says such and such and such and such own this property as joint tenants with right of survivorship, um, you know, business partner B passes away and, you know, leaves his portion to his firstborn kid, you know, which of the following is true. Mm -hmm. The kid's not going to get nothing. The business partner would have absorbed that interest because of that right of survivorship. Then we've got tenancy by the entirety for married couples only. You have to be married at the time that you take possession. This is not you got married after. If you get married after, we just call that a marital interest. So you were married at the time that you took possession. And if you don't specify, this is what we default to. This is the most common in North Carolina. If you're married and you buy a house, this is what the attorney will default to. It is equal. It is undivided. It is automatic right of survivorship. And the only way you can terminate it is death, divorce, mutual agreement, yada, yada. So the spouse cannot commit a half interest yet again. If you get a similar question, spouses own a property as tenancy by the entirety, the husband passes away, wants to leave the entire house to the kids, couldn't do it, right? Because the wife now is the owner. So be very careful. You will get a lot of questions about not just what these are, but scenarios. A, a person wants to do this. Can they do it? And you got to be very careful. Uh, talked about the common interest community hybrid ownership, uh, which was just kind of the unique things. The planned communities, um, residential subdivisions, condos and townhouses, there's a lot of legal jargon that goes in with that. But the biggest thing is knowing what each of these respective things are. Um, remember condominiums? New condominiums have a seven day rescission period because of the North Carolina Condominium Act of 1986. Mm -hmm. There is also a requirement that uh, the developer has to provide the public offering statement, disclose all the information prior to contracting. And remember too, there is no rescission period on resale condos. You would have to provide a resale certificate, but there's no, no back out date, right? Seven days is for new condos only. Remember the other thing, it's considered a hybrid form of ownership because you own title to airspace and severalty and then title to common areas uh, as hybrid um, tenants in common with all the other unit owners. So we consider that a hybrid because you own airspace to your unit and severalty, but common areas as tenants in common with the other unit owners. Townhouses differ in a big way because they actually own dirt. You do own your building, you do own your dirt. And then the common spaces are not typically owned by the uh, homeowners. They are owned by the homeowners association, which is a separate business entity that you pay into and they hold them out for your benefit. Okay. So townhomes does own, own dirt and then common areas typically owned by the HOA. what you got, Spencer? No, Seth, I was wondering, um, or is it too new? Uh, where would you categorize Airbnbs with like timeshares or no, they're short-term rentals? Short-term rentals. Yeah, short-term rentals, vacation rentals. Vacation rentals are defined as, in North Carolina, we define a vacation rental as any tenancy less than 90 days where the tenant has a primary residence elsewhere they intend to return to. Oh, okay. So most Airbnbs fall into that criteria. Most people aren't staying there more than 90 days, although I suppose they could, but at that point you would sign a formal uh, long-term lease, right? A four months, right. six months or whatever. Uh, co-op don't think too much about this remember i told you a co-op also called cooperative ownership you own personal property by way of stock options which gives you a proprietary lease no deeds for the units you don't own it you just get to use the d uh the 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 unit because of a proprietary lease that's granted to you for owning stock options that's it so this form of ownership has not enjoyed much popularity in north carolina to date it's not very common here so you'll only really see it on the national side Timeshares. Remember the 555-500 rule. That is very important. They love to test on timeshares, especially on the North Carolina side, because this all deals with our uh, North Carolina Timeshare Act. Five or more periods over at least five years. That's the definition of a timeshare. 
If you combine those together, 10 days in escrow is how long all monies have to be held. The other five is five-day rescission period on the purchase of all timeshares. And $500 fines for timeshare developers for every violation of the North Carolina Ooh. Timeshare yeah. Act with no yeah. maximum. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yep. Five, 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 five hundred. What's the last five? Um, well, the second to last five and five hundred with that five. Yeah, five day rescission period on the uh, purchase of timeshares. So the definition was five, five, right? Five or more periods over five years. And the next five was five day rescission period on the purchase of uh, timeshares and then $500 fines for timeshare developers. The only reason, remember, the only reason I separated out is because if you remember the definition, the definition is five or more periods over at least five years. And if you circle that, 10 days is how long money has to be in escrow, right? Five plus five. It just helps you remember it, right? 10 days. And then five day rescission period on the purchase of it. And then $500 fines for timeshare developers. Remember, the real estate commission will not find licensees, but they will find timeshare developers. Um, I don't think I'm going to be going crazy on that. Uh, encumbrances, remember an encumbrance is just a limitation on the property. There are two different types of encumbrances, financial encumbrances and physical encumbrances. The financial encumbrances, liens are the most common financial. Remember, liens sounds like loans, specific liens attached to a specific piece of property. The biggest ones that we've discussed in the financing chapters, deeds of trust and mortgages. Deeds of trust are in title theory states, which North Carolina is, and mortgages are in lien theory states, which North Carolina is not. Mortgages are a two-party instrument. The borrower is the mortgagor and the bank is the mortgagee. Deed of trust is a three-party instrument. The borrower is the grantor, grants le naked legal title to the trustee. The trustee holds legal title on behalf of the beneficiary, which is the bank. <coughs> Remember the main difference before we even get into the financing, uh, judicial foreclosure for mortgages, power of sale foreclosure for a deed of trust. Uh, real estate taxes and assessments. Remember uh, mechanics liens, Special priority, basically, when you record them within 120 days of finishing work, they sit at the priority as if they were recorded on the day that you started work or dropped off materials. That's kind of the special thing with mechanics liens. Uh, there's a few other extra notes in here about, you know, cost of projects. I don't think they're really going to get into to that, so I'm not going to spend as much time there. Um, commercial real estate broker lien, we did talk about this uh, very briefly. With commercial real estate deals, they're very time-consuming, very expensive. And so there is a right for a real estate broker who's doing a commercial deal to put a lien on a property to ensure that they get paid their compensation, right? That is what that is. They can put a lien on the property after fulfillment prior to closing. In other words, um, they've done their job. It's under contract, but it hasn't closed yet. They can put a lien on the property. Uh, general liens, remember, they go after a person's assets in general, right? Specific liens attach to a specific piece of property. General liens go after a person's assets, your, your bank accounts, your personal property, your real property. So that's the difference, right? Some examples of general liens, judgments, personal property tax liens, state tax liens, federal tax liens. Lien priority, remember first come, first serve. So when you were thinking of liens, everything is in order of recordation except for the special ones we talked about. So it is real property tax liens, highest priority. Second to that is uh, special assessments. Everything else is in order of recordation, except for the special rule of mechanics liens. But don't get confused because on the test, if you have a question about what's going to be paid out first at a foreclosure, even though it's not a lien, we always have to pay foreclosure costs first, right? Cost of actually doing the foreclosure, then the liens in order. So it would be foreclosure costs, real property taxes, special assessments, everything else in order of recordation. So be very careful on that. And federal income tax have nothing to do with liens, right? Mm. Your federal income tax has nothing to do with a specific lien, but your federal income tax could file a general lien against all of your assets. So they could, depending on how the question's worded. The federal government, if you don't pay your taxes to them, could put a lien on your property if they wanted to, but they would just file a general lien and they would basically go after, you know, Miriam's bank account, uh, Miriam's car, Miriam's house, right? Everything. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. 
Will they ever separate real property and special assessment liens, like to say which one's more important or, well, I mean, take them first? Um, they could. And if that's the case, then real properties first, then special assessments, but they're both considered higher priority. So they will both beat out everything else. But if you repaired them against each other, it would be real property tax first and then special assessments. This is that homestead exemption we talked about in the other section, right? Um, from lien enforcement, that is what it was talking about. Uh, writ of attachment, basically these are just different types of encumbrances. Writ of attachment saying that um this property has a court order against it and it can't be sold list pendants is a notice of pending litigation against the property that may affect title so we consider these both encumbrances they would limit the use of the property uh, or even be, being able to sell it restrictive covenants remember those are private land use controls but they are also an encumbrance Remember, encumbrances are not inherently bad. Restrictive covenants are not inherently bad, but they do limit the property. That's all an encumbrance is, is a limitation. Liens that can't be satisfied and pending litigation, those are quote unquote bad, but restrictive covenants are not inherently bad. Easements, remember we talked about easements uh, this weekend as well. Um, appurtenant easements, they're encumbrances, they are appurtenances, they run to the land. The one gaining the benefits considered the dominant tenement. The one giving the benefit is the servient tenement. Cannot just uh, dissolve those. The servient tenement, uh, I'm sorry, the dominant tenement would have to release the servient tenement. Remember, when we're dealing with easements and gross, it is a person and a property. An easement appurtenant is a property and a property. So pay careful attention to that. The most common uh, version of an easement in gross is the utility easements, but that's not the only way that it exists. So. Uh, creation of easements, express grant, implied, arising by operation of law, which is those prescriptive easements or out of necessity. Termination of easements, you know, abandonment, um, agreement, uh, non-use of uh, prescriptive easements, things of that nature. Remember encroachments, think of a roach. That is any time an improvement goes across a property line. You're not supposed to be here, just like a roach, right? That is what that is. An improvement goes over somebody else's property line. Could be a house, could be a fence, could be a pool, right? Whatever. Uh, property taxation and assessment. Remember, there are a lot of different types of taxes we talk about in this class. Ad valorem tax, also called real property tax, is the most testable bar none. But you have to be able to differentiate it. Remember, when we're doing real property taxes, we are basing it off of assessed value. North Carolina uses a per 100 rate, but you will see the mill rate and the per 100 rate on the test because some states use the mill rate. And so all you would notice how it's describing how to convert them. The real estate commission will expect you to be able to convert them on the test. I don't know about our test, but I know they will like that. They like that kind of math where you have to convert it from a mill rate to a per dollar rate to a per 100 rate, which we showed you. Remember when we, we looked at those, if we said a dollar and 50 per 100, my calculator. Out. My computer is not having a good day. Um, if we said $1.50 per 100, remember, if we wanted to convert 100 to 1 on a calculator, we just divide by 100, all right? So if this is a per 100 rate of $1.50, in order to convert it to a dollar rate, divide by 100. If you wanted to convert it to a per a mill rate, remember, 100 to 1,000 is just times 10. So we have the per 100 rate of $1.50, we're to convert it to a per 1,000, a mill rate, times 10. That's it. Remember when you're doing the math for real property taxes, my recommendation, if you're if you're comfortable with it, always convert the rate to a per dollar rate because then the math works forward and backwards beautifully. You don't have to do any times 100 at the end. So if you just convert it to a per dollar rate and do the math, it will always work out perfectly because once you have that per dollar rate, right, divided by a thousand, and then let's say that your assessed value was 300,000, there's your tax bill. Easy peasy, right? Um, Machinery Act is the act that regulates taxation, gives the municipalities the authority to tax in North Carolina. Remember, it is very local in nature. It is your city and your county and your towns that are taxing you, right? Not the federal level that is taxing real property. It is local. 
North Carolina uses a mandatory, meaning has to happen every eight years, mandatory octennial reappraisal, horizontal reappraisal by municipality possible in the fourth year. In other words, individual areas can decide on year four to change it across the board, right? That's what that horizontal means. Not just one or two people, everybody. Um, when we are dealing with this, let me just provide some clarity that you, what you may see, because it didn't come up in the slides. And so I want to talk about this for a second. You need to be aware of what we call an equalization factor. In North Carolina, when we are dealing with taxes, we are taxing you based off the total assessed value. So your rate is a correlation to that. So notice right here, it says in other states, the assessed value for the property taxation purposes may be a value that is less than market value, such as 50%. We call this an equalization factor. So if you see something that says on the test, a home is... Uh, has a market value of 300,000, but is taxed at a rate of 50%. Well, it, that means that you're not basing the taxes off 300,000, you're basing it off of times 0.5, 50%. So then you would do your tax calculations based off that. We call this an equalization factor and it can go up and it can go down. So if you see that, you've got to make sure you make that adjustment first on the test before you start your calculations. You could also see- 50,000 would be considered the assessed value? It would be what you're basing the taxes on. So it'd be the equivalent of the assessed value, but just be right. very careful because what they'll typically say is market value. And then, so some states will just say, we're going to charge you 80% of the market value. In other words, you know, what it's sold for, what it's worth, but we're going to tax you at a different rate. In North Carolina, we think ours is the same, even though it's not. And so we just charge you based off of what your assessed value is. Right. So you may see on the test, um, a home has a market value of 200,000, but it is taxed at uh, 125% of the market value. Uh, and it's a 15 mil rate. You know, what are the property taxes? And so what you would have to do is $200,000 times 1.25, which is 125%. Say okay, we're we're charging you taxes based on two hundred fifty thousand, and so now you would convert this to the mill rate one, two, three, so mill rate to per dollar rate, so times 0 0.015, tax bill would be thirty seven fifty. Does that make sense? We call that an equalization factor. So you may have questions that are very straightforward that say, hey, here this these assessed value. You may see a question that says taxes are based on 80% of this market value, 70%, 125%. And you would have to convert that value first before you start doing the math. It's called an equalization factor. Um, remember taxes, the tax lien is said to be attached to the property as of January 1, although it's an unrecorded document. Uh, they are not setting the rates until July 1, because I told you they don't they, they don't change your value every year, but they can change your rate every year. So on July 1, your annual tax rate is set. And then that's why you cannot pay your taxes until September 1st. September 1st is when your taxes are considered due and payable. That is a very important date for tax proration problems. In other words, when you see a closing problem or any kind of problem where we're going to be doing prorating and it's closing prior to September 1, you know that the taxes cannot have been paid yet. If it's closing after September 1, remember, it, it's got to give you more information. The taxes have either been paid or they're unpaid. And this is why I didn't like some of those questions that I skipped yesterday in the slides, because if it's after September and it's closing and it's unpaid, the attorneys are not going to leave it that way. They're going to say, let's just pay it at closing, which is why I skipped some of those questions. And so they're not going to they're not going to screw you with you on the test in that regard. So if it's closed at closing after September 1st, you would have to know, is it paid or unpaid? But remember, you're prorating for the entire year. Please don't use September 1st for prorations. Prorations are January 1 through December 30th. Every month has 30 days. The year has 360. Um. Legal descriptions, I feel like we're pretty straightforward. The only thing that I'll remind you of for legal descriptions, um, meets and bounds, it's going to be more about the terminology. Monuments, distance, meets, minutes, degrees, right? All of these calls, point of beginning, okay? All of these deal with meets and bounds. Meets and bounds is alive and well. We use it in North Carolina and a lot of other states still. 
just a, a verbiage uh, set of how to figure out where a piece of property is. Government rectangular survey system, that's the one y'all hated. Remember, there are 640 acres in one section, and there are 36 sections in one township. A township is six miles by six miles. A section is, bless you, Melissa, one mile by one mile, okay? And so the other thing to remember too is the denominator rule. If we are dealing with the Northwest one quarter of the Southwest one quarter of the Southwest one quarter, remember if we say how many acres are in this piece of property, one section has 640. So then just divide it by your denominators, divided by four, divided by four, divided by four, 10 acres. What's going to be the biggest thing you're going to see? The legal descriptions, remember, start smallest to largest. So don't let it start with a township. The legal description would go like this, and then it would say something like of section 10, township 3 north, um, what's an M? 3 north, range 6 east. So the appropriate legal description would be the northwest one quarter of the southwest one quarter of the southwest one quarter of section 10, township 3 north, range 6 east. Starts from the smallest, works back to the biggest, which is the township. So that would be the appropriate legal description. So what would a test question like that look like? Would it just be saying, find the, how many acres are in? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you what the most common thing is. Um, and it, it's not going to be, you're not going to like it, but uh, it's going to say something like, um, Tom owns the northwest one quarter of the southwest one quarter of the southwest one quarter of section 10 how um, much would it cost tom to purchase the rest of the southwest one quarter if it cost you know six hundred dollars an acre and so first and foremost you have to figure out how many acres tom has which is 10 and then he wants to purchase the rest of this but he already has 10 of it and so then you're looking at uh 640 divided by four so he's trying to purchase an additional 150 acres. Does that make sense? Because it's telling you that he owns a piece of this already, but it's a very small piece. So if he wanted to purchase the rest of this, remember in this section, the, the whole quarter, So basically he owns Southwest one quarter of the Southwest one quarter of the Northwest one quarter. He owns this. And so the question is asking, how much would he have to pay if it was $600 an acre to buy everything else that he doesn't own in this piece? Well, if it, that total piece is 160 acres and he owns 10, he's buying 150 acres times 600 an acre, $90,000. That's probably more often what you're going to see is a math question associated with this. Those are the two types of questions, math like that, or pick the best legal description. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Remember, property survey, not required, but a very good idea. It helps discover encroachments, floodplains, setbacks, uh, title defects, uh, all kinds of things done by a licensed surveyor. Um, methods of transferring title. There's a whole lot of, remember we talked about voluntary versus involuntary. Um, dying with a will is called dying testate. Dying without a will is called dying intestate. And that goes to the law of intestate succession. Mm -hmm. Talked about those voluntary versus involuntary. Um, lien foreclosure is involuntary. Adverse possession, right? Remember, that's trying to steal. That's ownership, claiming to own it, not use it. So don't confuse adverse possession and prescriptive easements. Same acronym, same criteria. 20 years, OCEAN. Open, continuous, exclusive, and diverse, notorious. Okay, just be very careful of that. Eminent domain is the right of the government to take your land for the greater good. They do have to pay you for it. And then condemnation is the process. Um, make sure you are very familiar with the terminologies. We gave you a couple slides about grantor versus grantee, mortgager versus mortgagee, vendor versus vendee, optional versus optionee, lessor versus lessee. They love to use those terminologies. Make sure you know all your ors and es. They will test you on those. They will not say the seller. They will not say the buyer. They will say grantor, grantee, optional, optionee, vendor, vendee. Um, here is the essential elements of a valid deed. So here's the nice comprised list, which is why I showed you that other slide that I liked a little bit more because it's easier to just see in one big picture. 
A deed in order to be valid has to name the parties, both the grantor and the grantee, has to contain those adequate words of conveyance, accurate legal description of the property, legal capacity of the grantor, meaning of legal age and of sound mind at the time, acknowledgement of the grantor's signature, delivery to and voluntary acceptance of the deed by grantee, and then deed must be in writing. Understand that recordation is not an essential element, so be very careful with that. It says usually by recordation, but it is not inherently recordation, okay? Other things. Uh, types of deeds, let's just briefly talk about those. We talked about these yesterday. General warranty deed. Here's those actual covenants, although we translated them for you yesterday. Covenant of season and right to convey. Covenant against encumbrances, except those disclosed to you. Covenant of quiet enjoyment. Nobody can claim superior title. Covenant of warranty forever, meaning as far back as it goes. And covenant of further assurance. If there's ever any issue, I will come and I will fight. Um, to ensure that the title is yours, right? That was that general warranty deed. Highest form of warranty for the, the grantee, highest form of liability for the grantor. Then we have that tear down special warranty deed. The only warranties they said, I own it and I've not encumbered it so long as I've owned it. Quick claim deed, remember, I don't even know if I own it, but if I do, it's yours. And then bargain and sale deed implies that I own it, but that's it. No other express warranties or anything. We talked about the special purpose deeds, correction deeds, trustees deeds, sheriff's deed, deed of gift. Um, excise tax, remember, $1 per $500 worth of purchase price. Purchase price. Always purchase price. And then the other rule is what? There's no change. If it is comes out to one penny, round up to the next dollar. They do not forgive change. So do not round down. They say it's a penny, give us a dollar. Okay. Yeah. So it is always purchase price divided by 500. And if it's a whole number, you're good. That's the answer. But if there's any change, you need to round up, round up, round up, not down, never down. Um, we just talked about this yesterday, so I don't need to really... Um, quick reminder, because we talked about this a while ago, land use controls, remember public versus private. Public land use controls deals with that peace police power uh, from the government to ensure the greater good of a municipality. Deals with things like planning boards, uh, zoning, ordinances, um, building codes, all of these things. With zoning, it's basically saying we want you to build a certain thing in this area. Remember when it comes to zoning, a couple of terminologies you need to be aware of. A non-conforming use is anything that is not matching what the zoning states, like a restaurant in a residential area. But remember, they can have a legal non-conforming use and an illegal <coughs> non-conforming use. A legal one is grandfathered in, like a restaurant built a uh, was built at a time that it was zoned for restaurants. Then the government changed the area. Now that area is zoned residential. They're going to grandfather them in because it, they were legally in compliance. They're not going to make them stop operating the restaurant. The government will say, you get to keep doing this so long as you don't do X, Y, Z. A legal non-conforming use is you bought a residential property knowing it was residential and then built a restaurant anyway. That's just illegal. The other thing to be aware of is a big change would involve rezoning. If you wanted permission to build that restaurant, you would have to go to the public uh, planning board and the commissioners and say, I would like for you to rezone this commercial so I can build this re uh, restaurant. A little change is called a variance, where they allow you to ignore one minor rule, like a setback line or something due to an undue hardship that only affects you. Okay. There's some other terminologies in here, like spot zoning. Spot zoning can be considered illegal if not for the greater good. Spot zoning is just where you go into a tiny little area and rezone a small space. Typically, zoning is pretty vast. So spot zoning is where you go in the middle of another piece of zoning and just create a little block. It's only legal if it's for the greater good. If you did it to help somebody out, you could go to court and overturn that. Um, overlay districts, remember, it's just two different ones hyperimposed over each other, two different zonings. 
historic preservation, historic guidelines and restrictions based on, you know, it being historic homes, aesthetic zoning could require certain color palettes um, or colors not to be used because it's in a high traffic area. So it looks good. Spot zoning is what I just talked about. Cluster zoning would be things like cul-de-sacs, grouping homes together in clusters to maximize open space would be cluster zoning. And then buffer zones could be zones that are put in between maybe like a, a very high density commercial area and a very low density residential area. So that way you kind of have this space in between these two different types of zoning. Please don't forget subdivision regulations are a public land use control. You are considered a subdivision anytime you subdivide a lot into two or more with the intent to birch it, uh, I'm sorry, build, sell, or uh, create a new street. That is considered a subdivision. And the subdivision is um, bound by the public land use controls. Remember, you cannot start marketing these lots for sale until you have the preliminary plat approved. And you cannot close on them until you have the final plat map recorded. Okay. All of that goes into subdivision regulations. Please do not confuse those with subdivision restrictive covenants. The other thing is public versus private roads, right? Road disclosure for subdivisions. I think we're probably good on all that. Let's get to some of the harder stuff. Uh, real quick environmental issues. Remember, lead-based paint, what's the magic year? 1978. And what's the magic word? Oh. Encapsulation? No. Nope. The word is just as important as the year. What is a star, right? It's prior. Prior, to prior, prior, folks. I promise you, there's going to be questions that say a home that was built in 1978 has this, 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 and this. Which of the following is true? Right. And one of the options is going to be it requires a lead-based paint disclosure. It doesn't. Only home was built prior to 78. So a home built in 78, they're giving you that year to screw with you. If they say 79, they're giving you that year to screw with you. It would have to be 77 or before for it to re be required to give that lead-based paint disclosure. That prior word is just as important as the word or the year, 1978, okay? So be very careful about that on the test. Now to go with the other environmental things, remember asbestos is a mineral used for insulation. It is considered dangerous when it becomes friable. The particulates get into the air. And so the preferred method of remediation is encapsulation. You can remove it, but it's exceptionally costly and you have to fully saturate it and you have to have licensed people to remove it. So most of the time we just encapsulate it, seal it up so it doesn't become friable anymore. Radon, colorless, odorless gas, only a material fact if it's at four picocuries per liter or higher. And the way that you uh, remediate it is ventilation. It's a gas. Just get some exhaust fans. Yeah. yeah. Um, the rest of these aren't really going to come up. Uh, formaldehyde, toxic mold, pretty straightforward. Remediation, removal, treatment, abatement, you know, program. Same thing, formaldehyde, you know, um, HEPA filters. Uh, ventilation and sometimes removal if possible. Uh, underground storage tanks. Remember uh, these, the biggest piece of these is the current homeowner is probably subject to cleanup, even if they're not the ones that caused any damage. So underground storage tanks can leak and cause contamination. And so that is the biggest piece of that. Um, yeah. uh, we started talking about this one the other day. Make sure you understand all of these agency things, right? Huge difference between a principal and a client and a customer. Third party and a customer is the same. Sub-agent is just the agent of the agent, right? And when we say agent in a normal transaction, we mean the firm. The agent could be an individual broker if we're talking about a sole proprietor. But in a standard real estate relationship where the firm is involved, the agent is the firm, which makes every licensee within that firm a sub-agent. Mm -hmm. We talked about that fiduciary role, right? Fiduciary means we are acting in their best interest, just like a guardian, an attorney, a, you know, a parent, whatever. Um, we are looking out for their best interest. Their interest comes before our own. Universal agent, highest power, can do anything and everything on behalf of somebody, not something we need in real estate. General agent, you are a general agent when you are working as a property manager and you are a general agent on behalf of your firm. You can bind those people to some things. Property manager can bind you to some lease agreements, right? Can bind you to some repairs, can bind you to you know, legal proceedings. And you, on behalf of your firm, can bind them to agency contracts, buyer agency, right? Listing agreements, all the above. 
And then the most common relationship is when you're working with buyers and sellers, you are a special agent. You have no authority to bind them to anything. You are an advisor only. That's it. You just give them advice, you give them information. They're the decision makers. We cannot make decisions on their behalf. Very important to understand, and I will die on this hill. Agency disclosure, the working with real estate agency disclosure does just that. It only discloses how agency works. In order to form an agency relationship, you need an agency contract. If you want to form a relationship with a buyer, you use a buyer agency agreement. If you want to use a uh, form a relationship with a seller, you use a listing agreement. Okay. Of the listing agreements, remember there's a couple types. The other thing too is with dual agency, remember there is no dual agency contract in North Carolina. We have a provision on our listing agreement and our buyer agency agreement. And even if they authorize dual agency from the get-go, you're not a dual agent until dual agency arises. If a buyer that you have an agency agreement with says, yep, dual agency is cool. You're just an exclusive buyer's agent until the time they want to do what? Make an offer. More specific. Show a home or first substantial contact. No, because we've already passed that, right? I said you're a buyer's agent already. So you've got a buyer agency agreement that authorized dual agency but you would not be a dual agent. You would be an exclusive buyer's agent until what happened? You have a written closing. Contract. Make an Both offer. party sign. Until there's an offer. Until both until parties agree. Until the contract that you're representing. Let me rephrase the question. <laughs> you have a buyer agency agreement signed which means you're representing a buyer and they have authorized you to act as a dual agent. But I'm telling you, even though they've authorized it, you are not a dual agent. You are an exclusive buyer's agent and you would only become a dual agent when? The seller agrees. Both parties both agree. When both parties yeah, both would have to agree, but that doesn't mean that that's when, you, you got to give me something else here. Both parties agree in writing. So, until the buyer you're working with wants to see a house listed by your firm that is when you um, become a dual agent oh. yeah <laughs> it's like duh now we're, now we're grasping uh, for straws duh. here right i'm just asking when did you become part. a dual agent when they wanted to see a home listed by your firm yeah. so let's play this game again on the other side you sign a listing agreement with a seller and the seller authorizes dual agency but you start off as an exclusive seller's agent regardless, up until what point? An until offer comes in. An offer comes in from the same agency that you're representing. Firm, thank you. Firm. There it is. Yeah. It's not just an offer coming in. Folks, if I'm with XYZ and I sign a listing agreement that authorizes dual agency and Spencer's a buyer's agency, uh, a buyer agent with uh, Keller Williams, and he puts an offer in, dual agency will never arise. Right. Because that is just cooperating brokerage firms. Understand that them authorizing it does not mean we will do it. There is a difference there. Yeah. It could never arise. It would only arise if somebody by the same firm was on the opposite side. So for a seller, it would only arise when a buyer being represented by our same firm wanted to put an offer on the property. For a buyer, it would only be when the buyer wanted to see a listing that was listed by our property. So be very careful with that. Just because we've gotten permission to do it doesn't mean we're going to be doing it or even acting as one. Mm -hmm. Property management contracts, that is a relationship between a uh, property owner and a broker. And then tenant representation contracts, it's just when you're representing a tenant, trying to help them find a property to rent. Um, so please. Yep. If I'm not mistaken, there was a question. We've been trained that a broker in charge cannot have designated dual agency or against a provisional broker in their under their care. Mm -hmm. But there's, I, if I'm not mistaken, there's a question: what relations about the relationship between the broker in charge and what is the provisional broker to? What would the provisional broker be? And it said dual agent. 
Does that make sense? Yeah. It, well, hold on. Be very careful, Spencer, because do not put words that aren't there. Dual agent and designated agent are completely different. So okay, let me remind just, you. A, yeah, it wasn't designated. I'm sorry. I'm just. Yeah. A, if you are taking the test and it says, which of the following is an example of dual agency? And it says a broker in charge of doing a deal with their provisional broker. That is a perfect example of dual agency. And it is completely legal because oh, it never okay. said the word designated. But it can't they can be do designated. a deal together in dual. Remember, dual is worthless. You are bound and gagged, right? Nobody right. can say, we're, sing, we're holding hands and singing kumbaya. So a broker in charge and a provisional broker can do dual agency together. But not they designated. Be designated against each other. Right. The other okay. thing that I'll, I'll caution you on is it is specifically their broker in charge. When we are dealing with firms, let's say Keller Williams, has office A, office B, and office C. Ooh, that's a crazy scene. All offices have their own BICs. Mm -hmm. So it is literally their broker in charge. Office C's BIC could do designated dual agency against office A's PB because right. they are not under their supervision. They're under their supervision. It is very specific. If if it was a PB under this person, right, they could not do designated against each other, but they could do dual together. They could do dual together. Right. But you cannot go against your broker in charge. And every office has its own broker in charge, even if it's the same firm, which it makes it still do dual agency. Does that make sense? Yes. That's because you're per the broker in charge is privy to all the information that the provisional broker is. Has. Correct. Um so just a couple other notes within this agency, right? When we're dealing with this, I, I told you, I don't really like this slide. And we talked about this way early on in the class. So for all intents and purposes, when we say that you're, you know, an exclusive buyer agent, think single agency. Because if you are only representing the buyer, it basically is the same as single agency, even though this implies that it's a firm that only does one or the other. I, I don't think that's necessary to provide that distinction because of the way that the questions are going to be asked, especially if you think about it. If it is... Exclusive buyer agency, that means that your firm only represents the buyer. Otherwise, if your firm is representing both, we'd call it what? Dual agency. Dual agency. That's it. I was on a trick. Mm -hmm. So the other things to be aware of is how some of these relationships uh, and agency agreements terminate. Remember, listing agreement and buyer agency agreements can die in different ways. If we have a listing agreement with a seller, and the house burns down, does that kill our listing agreement? Yes. 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 Because it was property specific. If we have a property management agreement with a homeowner, does that kill our property management agreement? If the house burns down? Yes. 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 You have nothing to rent. Please. There you go. It was property specific. If you have a buyer agency agreement with somebody and you're under contract on a house and the house burns down, does that kill your buyer agency agreement? No, they can buy another house. Correct. It was never property specific. It was general, right? What kind of property? They can just go buy another house. So be very careful with that. How about this? If you have a listing agreement with somebody and the seller dies, does that kill your listing agreement? No. No. No, because the family can sell the house. I can say yes. It is yes. It be is. very careful. Remember, agency contracts do die with death of the parties. I oh. told you sales contracts do not. That is a huge factor to distinguish. Mm -hmm. A sales okay. contract would survive death between buyer and seller, but a listing agreement and a buyer agency agreement, all of those uh, agency contracts would die with death of the party. So if a seller dies, our listing agreement is dead. What about if we die? No. No. Adult diapers. True. If they are sole proprietor. There you go. If we are affiliated with a firm and we die, XYZ is actually the agent. XYZ is still alive. It does not kill our agency agreement. It's alive and well. But if we were a sole proprietor, that's right. it. It's just us. If we die, does that kill the agency agreement? What if the whole firm burns down? Well, the, firm, <laughs> the, the building um, is, is just a structure. It's not the firm. The firm is a concept. So right. even if the building burned down, now, unless every single person, including the BIC and the QB burned down inside it, which is a horrific example, Spencer, then that would change things, right? 
So. <laughs> but you know, at least I'm yeah, only killing one do- people. Spencer just killed a hundred. I mean, it's getting dark real quick. Sorry, they could they could still work from home though, right? Yeah, they could still work from home. Now, it, now let me change this up. If the firm was to dissolve, meaning the QB didn't renew the license or they, you know, turn it in or whatever, then that would kill that agency contract. Be very right. careful on the test because it's going to try to trick you with these sole proprietor things. It's going to say what's going to happen. And it's going to say, well, the agency agreement would terminate, but the real estate commission would take over and assign it to somebody else. They don't do that. The mm-hmm. commission does not have anything to do with anything like that. So that right. the, really, truthfully, the seller would just have to go find a new agent. Agency agreement would die. The seller would have to go find a new agent. That's it. What you yeah. got, Lala? Um, just taking this back just a little bit. Um, I was taking one of the, the tests or something last night, and there was a question, and it was asking about whether um, communication should have been in writing or oral between... Um, I guess it was saying if you are the agent of the buyer, then your your agreement is in writing. So it had to be written if you could um, do dual or no, maybe not dual. Maybe it was something else. But I, I'm trying to think of how the question was really worded. Um, but it was like if you had an agreement, then it did have it did have to be in writing. If it was oral, then that was oral as well. Yes. And so let me expand on that. And this is where you've got to, you, you, folks, you got to understand that the questions are always going to be pick the best answer. And let me explain. If you are working with a buyer, we all understand that if we have an oral buyer agency agreement in the eyes of North Carolina, that's okay. We can work with them. We can show them homes. We can do whatever. We would just have to reduce it to writing prior to presentation of an offer. So if we have an oral buyer agency agreement, although the rule states that dual agency is only with informed and written consent, you can do dual agency with oral consent if that's the only agreement you have currently. So in other words, if a buyer with oral buyer agency agreement with you wants to see a house, you would just need oral consent to show them the house that's listed with your firm. But you would have to reduce it to writing at the same time that you reduce the buyer agency agreement to writing. Does that make sense? It does now, but I kept getting it wrong because I just kept saying it had to be in writing. And even though it was oral and then like I was taking one of the quizzes last night and it was like, no, that's fine. If your agreement's oral, then that can be oral as well, but it just has to be reduced. So I was like, wait a minute. Correct. And so (laughs) if if you have a written one from the get go, then you would just need to update that written one. Right. Because you've already got a written one. And so now there's no really special exception because if they were willing to sign an actual buyer disagreement, then you just need to update your buyer disagreement to include dual. But if you don't have a written one, you can't force them into having a written one over this one thing. So you can have oral permission to act as a dual agent up until the time you reduce it to writing. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for the clarity. Mm Mm-hmm. Let's see. Man, time is just flying. I, 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 I already said this, but let me make sure that I clarify. Please be very careful. You will get a lot of questions on the working with real estate agents disclosure and about first substantial contact. Folks, first substantial contact is the deadline. So please understand that they're going to focus on the rules. So they're not going to, they're not going to basically say something where you have to disclose how agency works when you first meet a consumer. Is that a good practice? Sure it is. But they're not going to focus on good practices. They're going to focus on the rules. So it may give you a scenario, right, of um, buyer A enters an open house and has, you know, a 30-minute conversation with the broker in regards to the home. She finds out, you know, what's in the area, you know, the features of the home, what the home's listed for. Um, you know, at no point does, did the seller ever go over the working with the real estate agent's disclosure with the consumer, which of the following is true. It's going to give you scenarios like the uh, agent violated license law because they didn't disclose agency at first substantial contact. Um, the agent did nothing wrong. Uh, the agent should have disclosed it as soon as they started talking about features on the property. And this is going to be one of the scenarios where they, they've done nothing wrong. It is very possible to have an hour, two hour, three hour long conversation with somebody and never need to give them the agency disclosure. When the conversation hits for substantial contact, that is when you stop it and you say, let me explain how this works. 
You never have to do it if the conversation never goes into confidential information. So please understand that the, the questions are going to go by the rules, not what is best practice. If you're meeting with a seller, it's almost for sure that we're going to go into first substantial contact. So I just do it at the beginning of my listing presentation in the real world. But the questions are not going to be what's the best practice. The questions are going to be what was the deadline? When did they have to do it? Does that make sense? Yes, the other thing to understand is working with a real estate agent's disclosure is only a disclosure. It never, ever, 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 ever creates an agency relationship. After you go over it, you ask them to sign it. Remember, signing is not required because you can't force somebody to sign something that you don't have a relationship with. So after they sign it or not, you would then say, I'd love to be your buyer's agent. And you would have to create an actual agency relationship. In North Carolina, you cannot do any agency activities unless you are an agent. So you would either be representing the buyer or the seller. And you would have had to have created that relationship the right way. Then you can show homes and you can do this and you can do that. And if you're not representing anybody, then you can't do anything. But you still have to document that you showed them the working with real estate agents closure. Yep. That would be have to retain for your files. Remember that that retention of records, three years from the date of last activity. If you gave it to them, never form an agency relationship and never do anything else with them, keep that for three years just in case. Yep. Um, The only other thing that I'll tell you about the agency disclosure, let me remind you about the confusing nature of the unique things. The deadline is for substantial contact to everybody, except remember what I showed you in the license on commission rule book. If you are a buyer's agent, you would have to disclose at initial contact to the seller or the seller's agent. Mm -hmm. That is just a special rule, mm -hmm. not a seller sub agent. Remember, if you are acting as a seller sub agent, you don't have to give the buyer the disclosure until they start talking about um, first substantial contact, right? Price terms motivation. So a seller sub agent is still just at first substantial contact. But if you were a buyer's agent, you would have to disclose to the seller or the seller's agent at initial contact. In other words, if you want to show a listing for your buyer, you would call up this listing agent and you say, hey, I'm a buyer's agent. Right. I was but be very that. careful too, because what you may see on the test is it says in writing. And what I just told you was oral. What the rule states is it does have to be in writing. Ultimately, it does not have to be in writing initially. So you would disclose it orally, but then it gets put into writing at the time you submit an offer typically. So just be very careful with the way that the question words and pick the best answer. Because if it's in writing as the option, go with that one. Because it will ultimately be in writing. Does that make sense? Yes. But that is a special one. If you're a buyer's agent talking to a seller or a seller's agent, you have to disclose your representation of the buyer at initial contact. Everybody else is at first substantial contact. It's a tricky one. I hate mm -hmm. that one because it's so so squirrely. It doesn't even make any sense, but I digress. Um, 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 old car, you should be familiar with that. Uh, they may go into some specific questions, right? Like, um, Buyer's agent, you know, representing, you know, buyer A um, has a conversation with the listing agent. Uh, listing agent discloses to the buyer's agent that uh, the seller would, you know, take less than what the list price is in order to facilitate a quick sale. Buyer's agent puts in an offer, offer gets accepted, you know, which of the following is true. And you may have some options. And what they may be looking for is um, listing agent breach their fiduciary duty of confidentiality right because they right. shared secrets about the seller that they were not supposed to share so they may even get into these specific terminologies of like which one did they violate right was it obedience was it loyalty was it confidentiality sometimes they'll get specific and you got to pay attention to who because the buyer's agent didn't do anything wrong because once they knew that they were supposed to share it but the listing agent did something wrong by sharing their client's secrets does that make sense yeah, they're trying to trick us so much. Are they really, do they really want us to pass this or are they just trying I'm to keep telling us you, on our toes? Spencer, they're hateful people. I don't know. You know, they're, they didn't get enough hugs as children, Spencer. Now I they write these they tests. Evil. I don't know. Um, apparently. <laughs> I don't remember it being. They evil. Like, they wicked. You, say what? So what, Jeremiah? They evil, they wicked, they corrupt. That's exactly that. right. 
<laughs> Look, I'm gonna dress up as the real estate commission for Halloween. They're the scariest <laughs> people I know. What are you talking about? That's right. Oh, I'm gonna oh, dress up as the people that write the test. That's the best costume ever. All right. And uh, you walk into no, any room where there's real estate agents, no. they're all just gonna scream, ah! right? They're just gonna be terrified. <laughs> I vow not to let it seep into oh, my being. God. That sounds like a really good marketing strategy, though. It does, doesn't it? Right? <laughs> Especially as an educator. Um, uh, so I will tell you, they're 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 they are weeding back on it a little bit. They, I mean, they are mean, but they're they've kind of I think listening to some feedback of like, well, you're at, at a certain point, you're not testing them on knowledge; you're testing how much you can trick them, right? Mm-hmm. And that's not really fair, you know. Like, I mean people can be tricked pretty easily you go to magic shows all the time and you're like oh my god she's floating we know she's not but somehow they're tricking us right so it seems a little cruel <laughs> to see me, like, how gullible time. we are versus how much we actually know and so i think they're getting a little bit nicer in that regard i don't think it's fixed 100 percent yet but it's getting better um but yeah you just gotta mm. be very careful oh will it be a little better by saturday yeah i i mean it's a little better nope. based on what it was a year ago but <laughs> remember i'm not so much worried about our test because if <gasps> you've been doing learn test pass you're going to be feeling pretty good for our test um i'm more worried about the state test the state test is the meanest one right because mm-hmm. and, and let me help you out i've had plenty of students folks and this is honest to god i've had plenty of students who take the learn test pass tests and they're like, Seth, I was feeling so good. I was getting like 85s and 95s and like I was doing great on them. And then they go and they take the PSI practice book that I told you about. And they're like, I was getting 60s. I said, yeah, that's why I like that book because those questions in the PSI book are worded just as mean as the actual ones are. And so you get this false sense of security getting used to the way that we ask questions. And then you get exposed to the way that the other people ask questions. And you're like, oh my God, right? So that's yeah. why I like both. The learn test pass is the best for the knowledge piece. The PSI test is good for the tricky verbiage that you may see. Does that make sense? And the students that have had the most success have done both. If you do both, you're you're very well prepared um, going into the, the test. If you've done all the learn test pass, and then you do a decent amount, of, especially on the North Carolina side with that PSI practice book, those are my students who more often than not pass on the first try. And then so they'll disappear the- into the the Caribbean somewhere when I just kidnap them, you know, just, what you got? I'm just wondering going through all this, how does it affect the, your disposition? Once you get your license, are you going to be pissed off or in that kind you of stress? Uh, gray hair, all that. Yeah. yeah. Ready to go. Uh, ready to be everything. <laughs> yeah. And is this like, just for the state part? Like, well, I know that, I know that it's like some of the stuff is like national, but this will really reel us in into the state part of the, exam does that make sense yeah this well so here's the thing that you got to understand like and let me just give you the example again because we're in this section and Vi, you can go ahead and ask your question while i'm answering this one um so do the tests vary from school to school like yes the the our tests are designed by the real estate commission gives us the authority to write our own test they used to give us some tests and i don't know why they got rid of it but basically they said that we can use our own textbook we can write our own tests but the only information that we have from them is the syllabus so we can't see their tests but i'll tell you what by we've been really big advocates trying to force them to make instructors take the test because i'm a firm believer if i can't pass the test myself then i shouldn't be able to teach this class are we going to do it so I, I'm begging them. I'm like, please let me take the test. I, I mean, I'm not worried about me, but there's some instructors that I think are probably out there teaching pre-licensing. They would not pass the test themselves, which is a scary thought. You know, oh, how can they teach students if they can't even pass the test themselves? Yeah, because so, yeah. I mean, I just feel like my last go around, it was really just it wasn't teaching. It was just reading off of slides. And exactly. That's worth nothing. Nothing, you know how to read. What good does that me. do you? Right. Yeah. So it's like you, you were, throughout the whole class, you gave examples and things to relate it to. So it made it more. Uh, uh, it stuck better. Yeah. 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 And, and that's, you I'm know, like, at like least said. you had some slides. I, I had zero technology, like none. We just had a whiteboard. That she drew oh, on from time to time. We didn't have anything but a, a <laughs> bunch of quizzes to take home, and that was it. There was there was nothing else. There was no outside links, no outside help, no nothing. 
That yeah. sounds very difficult to navigate with just a couple of whiteboards. Like, I think PowerPoints are invaluable for this because it, it you know, th there really are, there's auditory people, there's hands-on people, and there's visual people, at least to the extent that people believe that's how they learn. There's some studies, you know, that go back and forth, but if you believe that you are a more visual learner, you'll pay more attention to the slides and then you'll correlate them to what somebody's saying. So you, then you get all of the pieces. If you don't have all the metrics, then you're, you're really playing to like the, the 10%. And the 90% are not learning the way that they should be. It's just the way that it works. So you kind of have to have a little Vi bit of all of them. Uh, Vi and I might have had the same experience, but online versus classroom. Yeah, my I was online and it was just slides. And we didn't even get, the, we didn't even get like a copy of the slides, you know? It wasn't like, was that we could go back through them. We, huh? we went to Was the same CES? school, I think, but she just took it online versus me taking it in class. And so you guys even getting the slides were way better than what we even got in the class. I know CES shop sucks. Oh, the nah, CES this was, shop? Nah, it wasn't that. Um, I don't know if it's against the rules to say, but it was it was Jan, Jan Secor or whatever. Um, yeah, Jan Secor. Mm -hmm. what, how do you say it? Jan Secor, Secor, I don't know. Yeah. Trash, name. basically. Someone's name? Yeah. She's, she's the owner of the school and she teaches class. So I took her in person class. Oh, wait. So did y'all both take the same one? Same school, we but we had different schools. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. And I'm um, taking Ginkgo Biloba and I'm thinking about getting some Prevagen. <laughs> <laughs> what, yeah, the game what, what's the other yeah. one right what do you what, why don't you just get some of those uh what, what is it that all the kids you adderall spencer yeah that adderall. too we need to go for this <laughs> test right <laughs> <laughs> any any of y'all have straight. kids with adderall i'm sorry <laughs> right yeah, right any young people right that's yeah right. Look, it up. look it up that's right <laughs> um real quick let me answer your question Miriam. um when we're looking at brokerage relationships laws and practice which if you look back that is the exact section that we were just discussing and my computer's still being stupid, but right here, brokerage relationship laws and practice. Mm -hmm. Notice how there's little notations here. There are some very specific North Carolina pieces, right? Cause these are relating back to North Carolina license law and commission rules, but the concept of agency principles, clients, sub agents, those are national concepts. Yeah. So you'll see both. It's just the very specific dual agency things, how we do it in North Carolina will be on the North Carolina side. And then the, the more general things. Remember too, you'll see the word facilitator and transactional broker won't be on the North Carolina side unless it's saying which of the following is illegal. So this is both. So that's why I'm just such a, a firm proponent of taking a look at this, this syllabus that we're looking at in conjunction with this, this outline, because it really paints a picture for what you expect to see. Because that section alone is over one fourth of the state tests and one oh, eight the of the national test. And so if you come in here knowing that, and when you look at this section that I'm talking about right now, and you're like, I know exactly what all these things are. And I know the ins and outs of it. You know, you're, you're better prepared for what you could expect to see. Now, obviously yeah. in the time that we've had today, you know, with only like 20 minutes left, 30 minutes left, you know, I, I <clears throat> haven't hit everything, but this is where you have this resource available. So you can continue on and take a look and make sure that as you're skimming through that you're, you're comfortable with a lot of these things. The other beautiful thing about the fact that I shared this with you, these are hyperlinks. You could actually click these and go directly to the laws, which this one's an ungodly long one. So please don't read this, <laughs> right? But there's like little bits and pieces that, that you may need agency agreements and disclosure. I would potentially go into the comments section and read about Rule 58A.0104, because if you go back to the comments section at the end, let's see. Oh, shit. Here it is. Uh, 58A down. Right here, 
Disclosure agency status by buyer agent to sellers or seller agents, right? This is where you're getting some really good information on 58A.0104 in this comment section. So that is invaluable as opposed to reading that nonsense, right? Come in here and look at where it gives you real world examples of the rules and how we affect the agency agreements and disclosures. And it goes into what I was just talking about, um, about disclosure of agency status by sellers, agents, and sub agents to prospective buyers. Continues on to say that it's for substantial contact by buyers, agents, to sellers initial contact so this is all very testable and so that's where you know that that syllabus has some value because then you can correlate it to other notes and easier places to read and look at the keywords right for substantial contact initial contact consent to dual agency right so it breaks it down in a little more of a user-friendly way if you're kind of looking at all the resources the comments section which we call the study guide of the north carolina uh license on commission rules the syllabus which is the the outline for the entire curriculum, and then the relink book, which is the formula for the test. Those are all three invaluable for piecing this all together to prepare you, uh, uh, you know, continuing on from what we've done, right? Because we, we've done a lot, you know, learn test pass is amazing. I mean, the success rate of students who actually do learn test pass is like 90% higher than students that do not. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that's what I'm going to do is just like go through this, like you said, the syllabus and get these three as far as like, you know, because there's so much material and some of it, some of it, I got it. Some of it's still fuzzy. Mm -hmm. So mm. real quick while I'm thinking about it, because I mean, we've gotten through a, a lot, but I mean, you know, there's still quite a bit left. What were the contract questions that you had so we can touch on those? Um, so it was. It was mostly with the option to purchase real real, real property. Like okay. there were a few questions on the, I was taking some of the exams and I was like, oh. So I don't have like a specific question, but it was just, okay. I don't know if you I'm can help you out with it nonetheless. That. When we're dealing with contracts, remember if you look back real fast over here, basic contract law is a huge, portion of the national 13 questions and so there's a big focus of things that they're going to ask you and a lot of it's terminology but then there's more than that so basic contract law is a very big section dealing with offer ors and offer ease right who makes the offer well that's the offer or who receives the offer well, that's the offer e it's going to deal with counter offers any change on an offer is going to be constituted as a counter offer and so then you would have to change the rules right now if you did a counter offer that's the offer or the other person's the offer e Remember, contract formation has to have signature and communication of acceptance. So that's a huge piece. And then the other thing, too, the agent stands in the shoes of their client. You'll get a lot of questions on that, right? Is this a contract? But to go to your point, the other things that you're going to have to look for are the terminologies. Unilateral versus bilateral. Unilateral means one promise, not one person. Bilateral means two promises. And so an option to purchase contract is the best example of a unilateral contract. And I promise you will see it on your test, especially in conjunction with unilateral, because that's the most common unilateral contract we talk about in the real estate world. Remember, there's only one promise. If I go to you, Miriam, and I say, hey, I'm thinking about buying your house for $400,000. If I give you $3,000, will you give me three weeks to decide if I want to buy it or not? So I've just paid an option fee to have an option period. You have promised me when we make this deal in an option agreement, you have promised me that you will allow me to have that three weeks, right? I promise Seth that I will not sell it to anybody but you over the next three weeks while you decide. But have I promised you I was going to buy it? No. I said, let me think about it, right? That is an option to purchase. So then, Miriam, if I come to you on week two within my option period, and I said, Miriam, I've decided to buy your house. Well, now I'm exercising my option to buy. And now we are in a bilateral agreement. If I exercise my option to buy, we're in a bilateral. I've now promised to buy your house and you still promise to sell it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the other thing that you have to understand is that while you may not see this conversation on the national side, you may see it on the, the uh, North Carolina side, our due diligence style contract works exactly like an option contract. We just call it a due diligence fee versus an option fee and a due diligence period versus an option period. But it works the exact same. That's why a buyer in North Carolina using the offer to purchase and contract form 2T 
is not in breach of contract if they terminate during due diligence. They've purchased the right to walk away for any reason or no reason. A buyer can only be in breach of contract after the due diligence period. Same thing with an option, right? An option, right? As somebody who has purchased an option is able to just leave at any time during that option period because they have not promised to buy. They said, let me think about it. Does that make sense? Yep. So that is the most common thing that you will see in an association with is, is unilateral contracts. It is a, an alternate land conveyance contract. It's a unique one. Works just like due diligence style contracts. Um, what you got, Wendy? Yeah, so um, about that, um, so I was watching Travis's um, videos on the due diligence and, and this uh, the 2P contract. Um, but I believe he was saying something to the effect that. Oh, uh, muffle. Yeah, can, can you, you hear me now? Yes, that's so much better. Were you, were you taking okay. a nap, girl? You laying on your bed or something? <laughs> now I can hear no. you perfectly. <laughs> Speaking through um, a pillow. Um, right. No, sorry. Um, okay, okay so I was, I was watching um, videos um, with Travis, and um, one of the uh, things that I was kind of confused uh, was about the 2T. He said that the due diligence is only within that contract, the, the 2T. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just wanted to clarify that when you offer a due diligence, um, it's, it's also included with the purchase price or the offer or... I, I don't know how to word it. Sure. I, look, I'm, I'm really good at this. I know exactly what you're asking. So let me talk about it. Um, when you're dealing with it, number one, you said it's only included in the offer to purchase a contract form 2T. That is true. You're not going to see discussion of due diligence style contracts on your test in any way, shape, or form, except for the offer to purchase and contract form 2T, which is a very specific form that we use in North Carolina. You will not see that on your national side. There's number one. The other thing is the due diligence fee is a negotiating instrument, just like the earnest money fee is a negotiating instrument. So that's important for two reasons. Number one, you still have a contract, even if due diligence money is zero and earnest money is zero, because it still has consideration, which is purchase price. So even if you've negotiated zero, we still have a legally binding contract. Now, the other thing to understand is when our, we looked at our offer to purchase and contract form 2T, our contract states that if the buyer walks away during the due diligence period, they have forfeit their due diligence money, but they would get earnest money back. If they terminate after the due diligence period, they have forfeit both due diligence money and earnest money. Earnest money is considered liquidated damages to the seller for a buyer breach of contract. Remember, liquidated damages is the terminology that means pre-negotiated amount if we breach. So if we were to breach, they would get both. But as long as the buyer goes to closing, they get both back at closing. So yes, we gave the money directly to the seller. We paid it to them. It went to their bank account, right? Wendy, remember what we said? If it's $5,000, they can get $5,000 worth of tacos, Pokemon cards, or bubble gum. We don't care. But as long as we go to closing, they have to give that money back to us. And it comes back to us as a credit at closing because it's basically used towards the purchase price. So if it's a $5,000 due diligence fee we paid to the seller, we'd give them that money on the day that we formed a contract. And then at closing, it would be a seller debit of $5,000 and a buyer credit of $5,000. Just like oh. the option, it, it's negotiable. The option fee could also be applied towards the purchase price when we're dealing with an option to purchase contract, right? Ours is because of the way the contract is stated, but because we don't have a standard option contract, it would be up to the individual option contract as to whether or not um, you know, it was applied. Does that make sense? It does. And now... He did mention something about um, when the due diligence is um, the due diligence fee is offered, the other party, the seller, would have to make a demand for the money, or something like that. Yes, let me talk about that for a second. Um, this is a very important thing that you may get asked. The way that this works is due diligence money is due the second we go under contract, right? That's why I told you in this class that contract formation is so important. The second we're under contract, the due diligence money is due to the seller. If the buyer does not deliver it on the effective date, then the buyer, um, we're still under contract. This is a very important thing to understand. We are still under contract. So what he's saying was the offer to purchase a contract form 2T states, 
that the seller would have to give the buyer one banking day after written notice. In other words, they would have to provide written notice. We have not received your due diligence money yet, and we intend to terminate if we do not receive it within one banking day. So you provide written notice to them. And if they have not delivered it within one banking day, which is a Monday through Friday, then the seller could elect to terminate, but it's not automatic. So now the seller could call the buyer in breach of contract, and then they could terminate within their rights for a buyer breach. Does that make sense? It does. Thank you. Yeah. Understand that if due diligence money and earnest money are not delivered, it does not automatically terminate the contract. Very few things automatically terminate sales contracts, but it would basically make one party in breach and give the other party the right to terminate. Mm -hmm. Same thing about, like, remember, this is, this is another good thing uh, to talk about. The offer to purchase and contract form 2T had that seven-day delay in settlement built in. Mm -hmm. And so if you're the buyer and your loan is taking longer, and you can't close on the day of closing, you're not in breach of contract until after seven days of uh, past the closing date. So let me just give you this example again. If you are dealing with closing on the 7th and it's now the 14th and you can close that day, no harm, no foul, right? There's nothing they can do as long as they were, you were going towards it. But the second we get to the 15th, you've gone past your seven day window that was allotted. And now as the buyer and the delaying party, you're in breach of contract. That doesn't kill the contract. That just gives the seller the right to terminate because of your breach. They would have to actually do it. Does that make sense? Does not automatically terminate it. It just means now they could terminate it and be entitled to all the remedies for a buyer breach. And understand this could be vice versa too. The seller could be the delaying party as well. Yet again, if the seller delayed it past that seven days, the buyer would have the right to terminate for the seller breach and be entitled to all the remedies therein. Everybody with me? Yes. And those are um, the conversations that we have. And if you go down, I think it's like um, the next section uh, on this. It's like the uh, sales contracts section. Seth, I have a quick question. Is sure. um, like if part of your property goes under what, like it's not a flood zone, but say that there's like a water issue, you get standing water in it. Would that be a material fact if you mean part like, of the property? Yeah, like part of the property. Yeah, like drainage the issues would be material fact. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Drainage issues would absolutely be material fact. If they're known, reasonably should have been known, absolutely. Um so yeah, here's the basic contract law. All of these terminologies are very, very much, you know, could be on your test, right? All of these are level two, except for bilateral, unilateral, level one, meaning just recall difference between bilateral and unilateral. Obviously, I told you the biggest thing that you'll see is whether or not, you know, a contract is buyer or unilateral, which option is the most common unilateral contract. Remember, folks, every other contract just about is bilateral. Agency agreements, bilateral. Sales contracts in general, bilateral, right? Property management agreement, there's promises from both parties. What, listing agreement, I promise to put one of my best efforts to sell your house, Mr. And Mrs. Seller, and you promise to pay me if I do. Now, that's an overly simplified version of it, but still true. Difference between valid, void, and voidable. Remember, void, missing an essential element, somebody who's been declared mentally incompetent before contracting, it's right, would be void. Um, and then uh, an illegal act, missing an essential element, an illegal act, and declared mentally incompetent are all void. Drunk as a skunk, high as a kite, voidable. Under duress, voidable. Being a minor, voidable, all right? Please be very careful with those. Valid means it contains all the essential elements. Now, the essential elements does change if it's like a real estate sales contract because then on North Carolina, it would have to be in writing to be enforceable in a court of law. Talks about offers, acceptance, right? Offerers, offerees, communication. Remember the mailbox rule? Communication, the UETA, Uniform Electronic Transactions Act as well. Communication can happen any way, via text, via uh, phone call, via email, via fax, right? As long as it's sent to the appropriate place. And then the mailbox rule is that antiquated rule that says, hey, if it was mailed to the offeror or the offeror's agent, it was communicating acceptance, it's been considered communicated the second it was in the possession of the United States Postal Service. Remember, it does not apply to anything other than communication of acceptance, not terminations, not negotiations, nothing else, only communication of acceptance. 
Uh, offers, remember, offers are very different than contracts. You can terminate an offer anytime prior to unconditional acceptance. So when you submit an offer, you can put an expiration on that offer. Remember I told you, what if you put an expiration of three days? How long would you have to wait before you could rescind that offer? You don't have to wait. You don't have to wait. You can do it immediately. You can send that offer and immediately take it back. So be very careful, right? We're going to talk about ways that contracts can end. Talk about ways that listing agreements can end, right? Talk about ways that leases can end. Talk about ways that offers can end. And they're all different. Offers can terminate by withdrawal anytime prior to unconditional acceptance within a reasonable period of time, which we have no idea what that is. Putting an expiration on it. Death of the party, destruction of the property. Those would all kill offers. If you put an offer in on a property and the property burns down, your offer dies because the property is not there anymore, the way that you offered it anyway. If you put an offer in for a buyer and the buyer dies, the seller can't accept the offer because they haven't accepted it yet. The offer would die. Remember, the agent dying would not kill an offer because we were not a party to the offer. So an agent dying would not kill an offer, but death of the seller, death of the buyer, destruction of the property would all kill an offer. That's crazy. I have been like trying to get that concept self and looking at it. And I don't know why just today now it's clicking in when I heard you re say it. Mm -hmm. And you said it yesterday in class. <laughs> I told you, uh, Mika, it, the longer you hear something, your brain will just accept it. And then it just clicks. That's yeah, because I was like, how did I get that answer wrong? I know the offer died if a, if a, a firm didn't die, but it was the offer. That the was offer. the key word in the question. The op yeah, right. A contract and an offer are exceptionally different things, right? Right. And so offers die a very different way than contracts die. Remember, a sales contract would survive death, right? The other thing I'll warn you about for sales contracts, remember, be very careful. From a national point of view, destruction of a property would kill a sales contract because we we would call that impossibility of performance, right? So it could cause somebody to back out because they're not getting what they're supposed to get anymore. But remember on our offer to purchase in contract form 2T, it stated plain as day that if the buyer wanted to, they could buy the burned down house and, and get the insurance money, right? They could. I don't think they're really going to screw with you on that, but I just like to bring it up just in case, uh, you know, they try to get too squirrely on there. But mm -hmm. offers and contracts are exceptionally different. Mm -hmm. okay? Isn't offers like um, very fragile? I don't know if you said that or Travis said that that you have to consider they're very fragile or something like that. Yeah, uh, that was Travis. And uh, and that's true, right? Uh, it is very easy to break an offer. It is very hard to break a contract, right? So that's a good way of putting it, fragile. Because if you say no thanks, you've broken it. Remember, uh, I said, think of it like a living thing. Travis wants you to think of it as fragile. Both are both are true. Mm -hmm. So if, if you think of it as like a fragile point of view, right? If you say no, or reject it, it's the same as dropping it. It's shattered. It's you, you can't piece it back together. So that's a good analogy. I think of it as a living, breathing thing. The second you, you do something, you kill it. Although that's a little more morbid than being fragile, right? Because then you're picturing like a little creature that you just murdered versus, you know, a, a little a snow globe that you dropped. So I guess yet again, my analogy is a little darker, but you know, whatever works for you, that's true. It is very easy to break an offer and you can't piece it back together. It's gone. But it is very hard to kill a sales contract. Do you understand that any sales contracts, right? That's another thing they're going to test you on. Mutual agreement will always kill a sales contract. The other ways that you can fulfill, right? Or remove, remember what we talked about. Uh, full performance. That's the best way to kill any contract, right? Full performance. Doing what you said you were going to do. Buying a house or selling a house, right? Um, obviously, you know, breaches can allow people to back out. Mutual agreement. You know, there's a lot of things that go in here. And these are just some sec other secondary things for that reality of consent. Remember we told you in contracts, we have to have this meeting of the minds, this mutual assent, right? And so there are certain things that would make it, you have a lack of that meeting of the minds or mutual assent. So a contract may be voidable if the mistake of fact, right? Involves a material term or aspect, uh, mutual and not the result of fraud or negligence, you know, mistake of law, fraud could make it potentially voidable, duress, Undue influence, um, some other things. Let me, let me. Here's that Uniform Electronic Transactions Act we talked about. 
making sure that you understand how contracts can be or offers can be communicated and accepted. Because remember, signed and communicated is what takes us from an offer to a contract. Remember when we talked about some things with uh, with contracts, release of the parties, innovation is a substitution of a new contract, modifying the agreement. We could all agree to change the term in the contract on a quarter satisfaction. That's kind of like that uh, partial performance where you accept something less than and then cancellation potentially if there's somebody in a breach. Um, a lot of different terminologies in here that you need to spend some time on. Cause like I said, this is a highly testable section, 13 questions on the national side for this basic contract law. So a sign or versus a signee that time being of the essence concept. Remember due diligence is a time is of the essence concept. No wiggle room. The date is the date is the date. And so on our offer to purchase and contract form two T due diligence says whatever date at 5. PM, that is when it is up at 501. You're past your due diligence period, right? You screwed up. Parole evidence rule says only what's in the contract is part of the contract. If you have verbal negotiations or email negotiations and never made it into the contract, we don't care. They're not going to be upheld in court in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> um, written overrides oral always. Contracts are always interpreted as a whole. Any amendments or changes, additions, so long as they were done the right way, are interpreted altogether. Um. This is just the damages, talking about remedies for contracts. What else y'all want to talk about? Anything else specific that's popped into your heads at this point? Oh, I needed to be here for the contract part, but I was in meat and Jesus. Yeah, don't worry, Malvina. You made it for the last minute. <laughs> I know. I was like, and I was telling these people, hurry up and shut up so I can get on this song. It's okay, Malvina. I, I, I recorded the whole thing. So uh, all the I conversations, so I'll, I'll, I'm going to post it. So. Um, it will yeah. be on there. And and truth to be told, I mean, we 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 got pretty substantially through. I mean, we got all the way through section 10 of the syllabus talking about a lot of different things, but there's obviously still quite a few sections like the financing section we didn't even get into today, which is where I highly advise you to send me your questions and I can piece together another video and release it to talk about a few other things. Uh, yeah, so because I had a couple of questions too, and they were in my pocketbook. Are you still um, thinking about doing another um, another session before you get ready to go on vacay? Um, I may be able to do one on like Thursday because uh, I've okay. got, you know, class uh, the next couple of nights, but I may be able to swing in some time on Thursday. You know what I might do because I have Thursday another class that's finished up. I may advertise it to them as well. And so that way we may have like a bleed over group between like one of my other classes and y'all's class. Since this is not formal class time, it doesn't really matter. Um, yeah. So that, that would way be amazing. Help. All of y'all study. Let me just, yeah. Seth, how how testable is the construction? The, the construction is testable, but maybe one or two questions. And so if you look, Spencer, let me just show you this real quick. The biggest thing is knowing verbiage, right? Terminology. It should be what section right. 16. Like fills and peers and yeah. Fifteen, sixteen. Here we go. So it's just terminology. I mean, if you look, it's we only were supposed to dedicate one hour to it anyway. And so mm -hmm. things like a one-story ranch home, you would need to know that it's the most expensive to build. Why? Because it takes more land. Okay. You're building out versus up. It requires more foundation. It requires more roof. It requires more land. Ranches are the most expensive. Two-story mm -hmm. homes, the uh, most uh, economical to build because you need less land because you're building up. The only thing you need more of is lumber, but you have less foundation, less roof. And then we've got the basic components of the foundation. So what you'll see is a question like all of the following are components of the foundation except. And so it'll say footings, uh, piers, foundation walls, and then it'll say like uh, fascia, right? Or sill. And you'll have to know that that is not part of the foundation components. So when we're talking about foundation components, the slab is actually a type of foundation, but footings, foundation walls, and piers are all <laughs> components to a foundation. Right. Concrete slab, basements and crawl spaces are all different types. That's why I said the slab is not always part of every um, uh, foundation. And then footings are dug below the frost line. So that is where you actually trench below the frost line, pour the footings, and everything is built up on the footings. And then this goes into some other things like components of like framing, 
uh, different types of framing. But one of the things that I know that they love to test on is this sill. It says major components. The sill, S-I-L-L, -L, is the lowest horizontal wooden component. So it is what sits directly on your foundation before they start building up the framing and the subfloor. So right. that is highly testable. Sill is the, the lowest horizontal wooden component. It's called the sill. The other thing that they love oh, is, is the, the components of eaves, fascia board, soffit, and freeze board. Those are two of the most testable things that I know about, but obviously they could ask you any iteration of this, this construction stuff, but we have some slides. It's, it's such a short lived chapter. It's just flashcards. Make some flashcards on the components of ease, the components of foundation, the components of framing, and you'll be, you'll be golden, right? Just remember what they are because it's going to be a grouping thing. It's typically associative, right? All of the following are components of this, except, or which of the following is a component of this, right? Whatever it may be. Absolutely. y'all. It, it's been an absolute pleasure. I'm, I was happy to do this uh, and do some review. And like I said, if I can do something Thursday, I'll send out another message and I'll share the link with you um, and see do. if we can have some more people make it. Um, Cause like I said, I'm about to have three weeks off when I go to Disney world and I come back, I don't teach for like another two weeks. And so I'm like, I'm going to be twiddling my thumbs. So I might <laughs> we as well be sitting here waiting for you to take the, take the class. <laughs> right. When you get back, can we, do I may be right? anyway. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. Nothing wrong with that. Maybe um, set up some, um, would you like to do tutoring or something? Like I can like pay you or something to mm. go tutoring? Typically I don't do that, Nicole, just because I don't typically have time, but if you feel like you need it, you can email me and we can talk through something because I may have okay. some time um, when I get back from vacation. And so I may make an Perfect. exception, but normally I don't, um, okay. but I might, I might. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Think so. you this has been very helpful. Part of me wants to take the test today. And then part of me says yeah, you no might, it feels like you might as well sign send it to you? And take it again. No, <laughs> they I don't think yet, so. Did they? Okay. Yeah, uh, uh, I, I think they're going to send it on Friday morning. Like I said, I think you'll get it officially Friday morning is what I've been told. Um, but seriously, y'all keep doing Learn Test Pass. Email me or post it in Google Classroom. I'll keep an eye on it. If there's any specific questions you want me to go over, that way I can find them, pull them, take a recording. As soon as this video buffers, I'll put this on the, um, the Google Classroom as well. And like I said, it'll either be a Dropbox link because I think this will probably be too big of a file to just download. So I'm going to have to upload it to Dropbox and then share it that way for you to watch it. I'll figure it out, though. I'll get it up there today. Let me know if there's anything else I can help you all with. I'll look at my calendar for Thursday. And if I can do it, I'll post it in Google Classroom. But seriously, reach out to me. Any questions? I'm here for you all. I want you all to be extremely successful. So I've just got night classes the next couple of nights. So if it takes me a while to get back, that's why. Okay. Thank you. thank you, Steph. Safe travels. Absolutely. You. You're so welcome. Thank and you. thank you so thank much. You. Thank have you, Steph. Have a good day, guys. You got it. Y'all have a lovely, everyone. lovely have day. day. Y'all stay everybody. in touch. Good luck. Good luck, everybody. Good luck, good luck everybody. Good luck. Good luck. Woo. Oh, the hell, Jeremiah. Oh, oh, damn. I this, is, this is rough. I got to stop thinking so much. I'm just doing it. I got to clear my head and just study later tonight. You all have a good night and see you on the other side, I hope. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. See ya. Have Bye, fun. Y'all. Okay. See y'all.